from Austin, Texas, it's The Cube, covering Pure Storage Accelerate 2019. Brought to you by Pure Storage. Howdy, y'all. Welcome back to The Cube, the leader in live tech coverage. We're covering day two of Pure Accelerate 19. Lisa Martin with Dave Vellante, welcoming to The Cube for the first time from ESG. Mark Peters, Principal Analyst and Practice first Director. First time with you. Oh, yes. my apologies. You are so young. <laughs> I wish, I yes. wish that were true. You, in fact, were one of the first uh, analysts. I think that's true. If not the first analyst ever on theCUBE, I yeah. think. Well, I'll say welcome back. Thank you. We're glad to have you here. So, you've been with ESG for quite a while. You know the storage industry inside and out, I'm sure. Pure, just about to celebrate their 10th anniversary. Yesterday we heard lots of news, which is always nice for us to have fodder to talk about. Sure. But I'd love to get your take on this disruptive company, what they've been able to achieve in their first 10 years, going directly through, as Dave's been saying the last two days, driving a truck through EMC's install base back in the day. Your thoughts on how they've been able to achieve what they have. That allows me to talk about something I really want to talk about, and I think it addresses your question. How have they been able to do it? It's by being different. Um, and I don't know, I mean, obviously you do a stack of interviews here, and maybe other people have talked about that, but um, that is the, and when I say different, I don't necessarily mean technology. Um, I have a, a kind of standard riff in this business that we get so embroiled in the technology, do not for one second think it's not important, but we get so embroiled in that that we miss the, the human element or the emotional element, and um, I think that's important. So, they were very different. They created you know, these, 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 these uh, armies of fans who just bought into what they did. Now, of course, that was based on initially bringing Flash to the market, making Flash affordable. They've extended that here with the, the C announcement. Um, and other things as well, sorry, I don't want to just focus on that. But you know, they've continued to do things differently with the technology, but I think what really made them an attractive company and why they've survived 10 years and are now big, sizable, um, is because they were a different sort of company to deal with. Are you at all surprised that the fourth Accelerate is in Austin, Texas? In totally. Dell's backyard? Yes. They're uh, bold, well, they're disruptive, they're different, they're bold. Well, okay, you see, but, but also, did you go to the other three? Uh, the last two? I was trying to remind myself where they were. I know one was like kind of on a pier and in a ballpark in San Francisco. One yeah. was, uh, you remember the one that was in that uh, disused out wharf? Which yes. was, but that was a, a rusting. So uh, cool. It, it was a, but it was a metaphor on a rusting spinning disc, right? But it was also such a, a, a different sort of place. Um, and so, and I promise But it was I'll also an FU at, at EMC, but anyway. Oh, uh, yeah, I agree. <laughs> um, and then the last one was in some sort of concert the Bill hall Graham thing. Civic, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah Rock Hall. Yeah, so they were all different. Yeah. And so, I, I, yes, I know this is Dell's backyard. Probably literally, because I'm sure Michael owns a lot of the place, but <laughs> um, it's also a kind of very normal place. And so there's a little bit of me that, I, I, I don't want to use the word worry, but as you grow up, and of course we've got the 10 year anniversary, um, we're in Austin. What's the tagline of Austin? I don't know. Ah. Hook them? No, keep Austin <laughs> weird. Oh, okay. Now, I don't want to suggest that Pure's weird, but they were always a little different. I said that's why I think they were attractive as much as anything. Yes. That's why they had the hordes of admiring fans all wearing their orange socks and T-shirts and cheering. Um, and as they get older, as they get more mature, as they expand their portfolio, Charlie was on stage talking not so much about scale as a problem when he was asked, but more about complexity. As you get more complex, you actually get more normal. Um, and so, I don't know that weird is the word, but a bit like Austin, Pure needs to keep Pure interesting. I like that. Very interesting. So you and I, we've been around a while, and we've, we're kind of students of the, the industry. I was commenting earlier that it's just, to me, very impressive that this company has achieved a new definition of escape velocity, achieving a sure. billion dollars. Sure, sure. First company since NetApp to do it. And I got a list of three par couldn't do it, Compellent, Data Domain, Isilon, Equalogic, Left Hand, all really good companies, all very successful companies. Uh, what do you think, and it, all coming out of the dot-com you know, crash, maybe that paid, paid part of it, Pure kind of came out of the, you know, the, the recession. Why do you think Pure has been able to achieve that, that you know, 4X 3PAR, for example, in terms of revenues, and it's got a ways to go. They'll probably do 1.7 this year. I think they have aspirations for five. I don't know if they right. 
publicly stated oh, that. I they hope prob they do. They probably have, right, yeah. of course. Why wouldn't they? Uh, thoughts on why they were able to achieve that? What were the sort of factors? Genuinely know, having no idea what you were going to ask me and now actually listening to the question, let me, you've just made me think of something that I had not really thought about That's why before. it took so long to ask the question. It was <laughs> a very, you know, very long question. to formulate well, an you, answer. You are, you are the star. <laughs> um, you, you used the word escape velocity. Let's think about planes. I mean, you know, I think it's, you know, V1, isn't it, to take off, which may be not the same as escape, which is in the sky, isn't it? But you get the point. Um, how long to really take off and be independently airborne? Um, they gave themselves, I don't know how much was by design, default, how it really happened, I don't know. They had an immensely long runway. You think the whole conversation about Pure for years and years was, oh yeah, yeah, they're making loads of revenue, but they lose 80 cents you know, every time they get 50. Um, that was the conversation right. for years and years. I know they've now turned that corner, and I think the difference actually, the more I think about it, yes, you can talk about product, yes, you can talk about the experience. I think those things are both part of it, but the other companies you named had cool things too. They all had cool products. You had, what was it, the uh, autopilot thing with uh, Compellent, and yeah, right. they had lots of people cheering actually in this building, I think. Um, 3PAR was yellow and kind of cool in a different part of the market. And disruptive, right? But they were both trying to get to the exit fast. Whether that exit was being bought or whether it was going under, I don't know. It was going to be one or the other, and for both of them, they got bought. I don't think Pure had that same intention, and it certainly got funding and backers that allowed it to take longer to That's take That's a really good point. I think there's a, there's a new Silicon Valley playbook. You saw it with ServiceNow, with Frank Slootman. It's like the Silicon Valley Mafia. Uh, Slootman, Dietzen, Bushri at Workday. They all raised a boatload of cash. Yeah and they sacrificed profits for, for growth. I mean, I, I remember Dave Scott telling me, you know, when he came on, uh, the board was saying, hey, we're ready to, you know, we're prepared to raise 30 million. He said, I need 80. Yeah. 80's chump change today compared to what these guys are raising. Well, I mean, I think, I mean, they pretty quickly raised hundreds of millions, didn't they? They weren't, these they guys, weren't yeah. scraping by on 50 or 80 million, which is, which is what you see. Sorry, can, one more thought? Go ahead. Just this escape velocity idea I think is interesting because the other thing about escape velocity is, is partly how long you take runway, orbit, whatever, but it's the payload. Um, and you know, the more the payload, the longer it takes to take off the ground, or the more thrust you need. Thrust in this case is money again. But if you think about it, <laughs> this is another thing where he and I are going to say we've been doing this a long time. The storage industry over decades has been one of the easiest industries to enter and one of the hardest to actually do well. Why is that? Because the payload is heavy. It's easy to make a box that works fast, big, whatever you want, in your garage, you, you know, uh, two men and one application working for a day. It's really hard to be interoperable with every app, every other system, operational needs, and so on and so forth. And so the payload to be successful, I think they understood that too. So, you know, they didn't let themselves get distracted by like the uh, initial shiny glittery we need to get out of this business. Mm. I, lo I love the parallels with payloads and rockets because of course we had Leland Melvin in their keynote this morning. I'm a former NASA geek. Okay. Talk to us about your thoughts on their cloud strategy, the evolution of the partnership with AWS. We talked about that yesterday as sort of this customers bringing this forcing function together, but being yeah. able to sort of simplify and give customers this pure management plane, this software layer, wherever their data is. Your thoughts on how they're positioning themselves for multi-cloud hybrid world? Okay, two thoughts. One cloud, then you also use the word simplicity. So uh, I want to talk about both of those things if I can. Um, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry this is not a very good answer. I think it's the truth. I mean, you can't exist in this world if you haven't got a cloud story and it better be hybrid or, pub, or, or uh, multi, whichever you prefer. That's I true. think those have very distinct meanings, by the way, but we would be here for an hour and a half. It'll be a CUBE special to really get into that. However, um, so you've got to do this. I mean, there is just, you know, none of the um, clients they're dealing with, almost none. That's not research. I'll talk research in a second, but, you know, glib statement, everyone's got a cloud strategy. It doesn't matter which analyst company you put up the data, we all do it. I want to talk about a cup, some research we've done in a second, but um, everyone will tell you a high number of people who have a cloud first strategy, whether that's overall or just for new applications or whatever. So they've got to do it. What's crucial to whether or not they succeed is not the AWS branding, because everyone's got AWS branding. It's true. Name me people that they don't work with. Um, or will not work within the next year or two. I mean, I'm sure there's one. Go on, you, you look like you were anxious no, no, to say something. No, let's go, yeah, you're on a roll. Um, 
But simplicity is really important. So, David knows we do a lot of uh, research at ESG. One of our cornerstone pieces of research is a thing called the uh, IT spending intentions we do every year. One of the questions this year, has been for a couple of years now, is basically saying, simple question, excuse the overuse of the word, is um, you know, how much more complex, is IT, you know, in your experience, more or less complex than it was two years ago? IT broadly, and you know the answer. I love this question, yeah. Yeah, you I, know the answer. Yeah. <laughs> and 66% of people say it is more complex now than it was two years ago. People don't want complexity, we all know that there's not enough skills around, got the research to back that up as well, and so simplicity is really important. Cos, who was sitting in this seat before me, I think, um, will say that the company, Pure, was founded on simplicity. That was the point, they were to be the apple of storage. Um, I think that's why people love them. They were just very easy to use. Um, and so, coming finally back to your question, if they can do this and keep it simple, then they have better chance of success than others. But how do you define success for them? Is it keeping their customers or getting new ones? That's a challenge. They do have a very high net retention rate. I want to say like 140%. Sure. But things like we have 140 a- 140% retention? Huh. Yes. How do you do that? So, so, uh, you this, is, so okay. this is, um, this is interesting. It's actually 150% renewal rate oh, okay. by the Mike Scarpelli CFO math of renewal rates on a dollar value, a net dollar value renewal rate ah, for the subscriptions. Okay. All right. Mike Scarpelli was the CFO of uh, ServiceNow, invented this model, and, and ServiceNow had like 100 and whatever, 15, 100, whatever, 20%. That makes sense. Yeah. And so it's a revenue-based renewal. Makes sense, sorry, for one Wait, second I but, thought you but, were retaining more people than you've got. But, so but, but 150% is insane. I mean, yes. 105% is great. Yeah. 150% is Sorry, interrupted your question. Unbelievable. Yeah. Well, I was just saying. No, it's good, good nuance though. Yes, it's and thanks for clarifying. It's, you know, companies can say, whether it's uh, one of Pure's customers or Pure themselves or a competitor, we, we are cloud first. We have a cloud first strategy and a company like Pure can say, we deliver simplicity. Those are marketing terms until right. they're actually put in the field sure. and delivered. So in your perspective, how does Pure take what IT professionals are saying? Things are so much more complex these days. How does a Pure come in and say, simple, seamless, sustainable, like Charlie Giancarlo said yesterday, yeah. and actually make that a reality? Well, I mean, obviously that's their challenge and that's what they have worked to do. To some degree, and this comes back to what I was saying at the beginning, to some degree it becomes self-fulfilling because you're, that's why your customers come back with more money because they bought into this. And so as long as they're kept happy, they're probably not going to go and look at 20 other people. Um, I'm not saying they never had any of that simplicity to start off with, but it's very interesting. If you go to a pure event, um, their customers, and this might be sacrilege sitting in this environment, don't talk about the product. They talk about the company. You're right. We and have they the talk same thing about yesterday. the experience, there's that word again, of being a pure customer. Yes. Um, and so they're into it. They bought into whatever this is. And as long as the product, please do not strike me down, is good enough. I'm not saying that's all it is. I think it's a lot better than that. But as long as it's good enough, but you're really well looked after. You know, a few minutes ago when I was saying that's why I think this market is about so much more than just how fast can you make the box, how big can you make the box, how smart can you make the box. All of those are interesting, but ultimately, I'm only looking at Dave because he's so old, ultimately <laughs> technology is a leapfrog game. Yeah? Branding is not. But you bring yeah, up so, so that's a good point, but, but we've not seen the competitors be able to leapfrog pure no. or be able to neutralize them the way, for example, that, that EMC was able to somewhat neutralize three par by saying, oh yeah, we have virtualization too. Yeah. You know, or you know, thin provisioning rather. Yeah. And even though they had a thin provisioning bolt on, it was it was good enough. Yes. Right? Yeah, and they sure. could they had the checkbox. Yeah. You haven't seen the competitors be able to do that here. I'm not saying they won't, but thus you know, far they have I think um, I was going to say basing this on my MBA, but I don't have one, so I can't say that. But you know, I've read the I've read the books. Um, <laughs> if you look at you know Harvard Business School cases I think the mistake made by the com competition was to assume that Pure would go away. That they would either sure. buy it or that it would fail. 
and we'll make fun of the fact they don't make any money for the first few years and you know the people going to them are going to be sadly mistaken when they can't add all these features whether that be cloud or whether that be analytics or you know flash blades or whatever else they're going to add and they thought they would just go away there are great parallels in history um, when you let uh, competition in and you just keep thinking at each point they're going to go away spot the accent British motorcycle industry when the Japanese came in they literally said we'll let them there are records. We'll, we'll, we'll let them have the 50cc market, because we don't really care about that, but we'll make the big bikes. Well, okay, we'll let them have the 150, 200cc, because really that doesn't <laughs> matter. And 10 years later, there was no industry. Well, uh, and, and I think what happened with EMC in particular, look, let's face it, Pure hired a bunch of EMC reps, they took sure. their product, and as I've said before, they drove a truck to the, the Symmetrix and VNX install base. EMC responded by buying X Extreme IO. Right. And they said, you know what, we're sick of losing the pure, we're going to go really aggressive into our own accounts and we're going to keep them with, with Flash. And then what happened is their account said, hey, we're good. We don't actually really need more storage because EMC tried to keep and is trying to keep both lines alive and now they're conflicted. Pure you know, had a well, clear mission. Uh, oh. I was going to say, you, you brought that? up a great point. Sorry, just real quickly. Yeah, comment on oh, it. I can listen. Well, <laughs> no, no, just because I think what's interesting about that is if you look at uh, how EMC, using my words accurately, yeah, yeah. Um, used to act, I think you said that too, so I'm not criticizing. Yeah, Nardell, right. Um, is they were exceptional organized marketing organization. We go that way. And if you're not going that way, you've got a big problem, both as a customer and as a, an employee. And so, but the problem with that is also is that way would sometimes become that way, and then it would become that way on the product, depending on what was doing well. So for example, they had you know, tens of thousands of feet all marching to the uh, Extreme IO beat for a few quarters, and then they would go off onto the next product. Pure just carried on yeah. marching to its beat down that runway, escape velocity. Mm -hmm. Sorry, question. A, a point you brought up a minute ago before we wrap here that I think is, is really interesting is that, you're right, pure customers talk about the experience. I think we were talking with a customer yesterday, and Dave was asking him, well, what technologies are you using? He started talking about workloads. Yes. So when we're at other events, you hear other names of boxes brought up. Yes. Here, to your point, it, it is all about the experience. So interesting in how they're you know, continuing to just be different. But to wrap things up, since oh. they're in my ear, we're almost out of time, I just want to take a minute to ask you kind of upcoming research, what are some of the things that you're working on that are really intriguing you in ESG land? I think right now, from my perspective, I mean, as, as a company, we're continuing to do 27,000 different things because there's so much going on in the market. So whether that's uh, security is massive area of focus right now. Um, even improvements in networking, so it's not just the regular run of the mill, you know, bigger, faster, cheaper, which is always there. Um, so AI, of course, and in, in all these, as, as again, you may both know, you will now, Dave knows, I mean, we're always looking at buying intentions rather than counting boxes. Um, so it's really where people are moving over the next few years. That said, to me, I think what's really interesting is two other things. Number one is, to what extent can, I don't think we can really measure this easily, but to what extent can we get people, talking about Pure again, to acknowledge that emotions, attitudes, experiences are an important part of this business? I'm old enough that I'm not scared of saying it, and I think Pure as a company is not scared of saying it. Do you know what I mean? I think a lot of companies don't want to admit that. Yeah. Um, and we all know that they have different um, corporate cultures and mantras and views, and so their customers reflect that too. Um, and the other thing, just generally, is I, I, the future of IT as a whole. I know that, I mean, I'm doing this and because none of us really know what that is, but you know, clearly, we, we, we've got to stop talking about the cloud at some point. It's just part of IT. It's not a thing as such. It's just another resource that you bring to bear. I don't know that we're yet at that point, but that's got to happen. Interesting, thanks for looking into it. I'm imagining this was a crystal ball. But Mark, I wish we had more time, because I know we could keep talking, but it's yeah, been a pleasure cool. to have you Yeah, that whole multi-cloud, hybrid cloud for an hour and a half. We'll come back and we'll have that all discussion, right. like what that all means, and yeah, yeah, love I'll to have you that. back anytime. Excellent. Great. Great Mark, guest. thanks. Thank you for joining Dave pleasure. and me. Thank you. For Dave Vellante, I'm Lisa Martin. You're watching theCUBE from Pure Accelerate 19.